pictures back as soon as they're finished scanning sure. so you could show the kids. Yes. And at the end of the period, don't go anywhere because it, I want to take your picture with Mr. Schoons. Okay. And I think I'd probably get a picture of his hat. Put that in the PowerPoint, too. You got lots of good stuff. You got lots of pictures. Oh, good. Good boy. <laughs> One of the veterans said he was on his assignment was um, he was his assignment was extremely classified, so he had no pictures of anything. I mean, he would have had a picture of himself in the service, but he said he kept nothing. So, he just didn't keep anything. Yeah, that's what <laughs> yeah. I thought too. I yeah. thought it was kind of unusual because he was very organized. That was Mrs. Dwyer's, Carol Dwyer's father, came oh. from Syracuse. He didn't have any pictures? You know him? But no, he's, you probably wouldn't know him because he's from Syracuse. His name was Walter Shannon. Oh, oh, okay. You mentioned Dwyer and I thought you were talking Oh, Bob, Bob Dwyer. Dwyer. No, no, yeah. that would be his father-in-law. Okay. Are you guys ready? Ready. Oh, okay. All right, go ahead. We're at Orchard Park High School. The date is Thursday, May 5th, 2005. And we are interviewing Mr. Jerry Schoons, who was a World War uh, II veteran. He is being interviewed by? Jeff Selzman. Sabrina Cartel. Marlena Holinsky. Okay. Have a great time. I'll be back in about 40 minutes and tell them what life was like and what the war was like. <laughs> Send them. Glad to do that. Okay. Best of my ability. Um, I, I probably should give you a little story about what I was doing in the war before you, you started questioning. So you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I was working at Curtis Wright Aircraft Corporation in 1941-42 uh, and, and into 43. But in the, in the summer of 1942, I enlisted in the Air Force and uh, was called in, in uh, late February of 43 into active service at that time. And I, I went from there to Nashville, Tennessee and was classified for, uh, for flight training and went from there to Maxwell Field in Alabama and spent two months in what is essentially basic training. It was done with a class system rather than you know, a sergeant over the top of you or things like uh, regular army. But it was uh, equally challenging. And uh, from there I went on to uh, flight training and uh, I didn't pick it up quite fast enough for the Air Force so they uh, took me out of pilot training and put me into navigation training. And I finished that course in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in uh, uh, March of uh, 1944 and went then to uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, for uh, where our crew was put together and for subsequent training. <coughs> and in, uh, in uh, <coughs> sorry for this, this voice, but uh, <coughs> in, uh, in, let me see, it was uh, June, I left that training and we went to Kearney, Nebraska, where we picked up a B-17, brand new out of the plant, all shiny aluminum. And uh, flew it across the, the Atlantic to uh, Northern Ireland and landed there, and then uh, went to England and, and uh, subsequently joined the 381st Bomb Group. Uh, our, our total crew joined, and we we did our first oh, 15 or 20 min missions as a crew. But after that, uh, the pilot and the bombardier and myself were made lead navigator, bombardiers, and pilots, which meant that we flew at the head of the formation, the squadron or the group formation. So uh, then the, we only flew missions kind of helter-skelter, and it took me about five months to complete uh, my missions. I was there until uh, March of 1945, for, which was a long time for, uh, for air crews to spend in. The job of the navigator is, is obviously to, to uh, keep track of where you are and to tell the pilot where to go. But I always told him very nicely. I, I, I didn't order him. <laughs> Actually, the pilot is the aircraft commander. B-17 
B-17s. You, have you, are you familiar with the plane at all? Or? Well, I have pictures. I guess she's still duplicating the pictures. Yes. <clears throat> but I have a lot of stuff here. So. Well, can you tell us, um, what do you remember from boot camp? Like your first boot camp. Yeah. Okay, boot camp in our case would have been that period of two months that I spent at Maxwell Field in, in Alabama in what was called pre-flight training. And that is that and that boot camp was run on a system as the same as the service schools do, where you have an upper class uh, uh, hazing the lower <laughs> class. In essence, that's what it is. Yeah. But uh, you learn discipline and you, you particularly learn self-discipline in situations like that. Uh, it, you have a goal. You obviously want to succeed in, in, in your training and uh, becoming what you want to be, in this case, an aircraft crew member. So you take all of that and, and as best you can and, and work your bones off you know, to, to make it go and, and taking a lot of guff that normally you wouldn't take. But it was interesting, you know, it was interesting, and, and after two months, we were, we were the upper class and could do the same thing. And uh, the system worked very well, I think. What was the hardest part about boot camp? About what? About boot camp. What was the hardest part? <clears throat> the hardest part was, this sounds kind of silly, but the hardest part was the Saturday morning inspection. We lived in a, in a wooden building which supposedly was going to be made, made up into a whole bunch of rooms. It was two-story, and it was probably 60, 80 feet long and 24 feet wide. And there were about 80 cadets, as I remember, in it. Uh, but every Saturday morning, some lieutenant or <laughs> captain or major would come through, and he'd have white gloves on. Now this place, as I say, was supposed to have rooms, but it was never blocked in. It was never, the board was never put up, the rooms were never defined. So all there was was wooden posts all over, and, and it was a very difficult place to keep clean, obviously. And they'd come in, he'd come in with a white glove, and invariably he'd put his cloth finger on some place and, and see black, you know, dust from it. And then he'd, then he'd say, okay, you guys don't go on. You don't get the weekend off, you can't go into town Saturday night and oh. Sunday. <laughs> uh, it, it was tough to pass those tests because we were very young. We hadn't been in service only three, well, two months at the most before this happened and had had very little training. A month was spent at classification center, so it was tough. It was a tough part. That's in the training end. Now, when you get to combat and, and see airplanes blow up in front of you and see people literally dying in, in the air, that's when it gets very serious and very troublesome and uh, affects your sleep and everything you do. Uh, I should say that we fought a, a very, very unusual war. Very, very unusual. When you think of fighting wars, you think of men in trenches or in the ground or, or uh, in some cases in, in boats and Navy people. <clears throat> but the big image I suspect that most of you have is, is, is uh, guys in the Army who are in, outside in all kinds of weather and fighting in, in foxholes and, and being you know, shelled and, and shot at by the enemy. And, and uh, you know, all kinds of situations. For instance, uh, the Korean people uh, had a very, very tough time uh, fighting in Korea in the winter time. The same thing was true in the invasion of Europe, going across to Europe, uh, much of it in the winter time, and, and snow, 
And that's really tough fighting. And, and, and we fought such a different war, it's almost as if we didn't fight in the same war. Uh, we, we, would, we lived in those steel Nissan huts you maybe are familiar with. They were cold, they had a little stove about that big around. <laughs> and the coal we had was all third grade coal. And the place was always about 45 or 50 degrees. We never were in there either. We were in the bed, in the sack covered up, or we had our jackets on. And, uh, but, you know, that was rough for us, but when we contrasted about the guys you know, in, in the Hertz and Forest section, for instance, that battle in the winter, uh, in the snow, God, it was, it was great for us. But the most unusual part of it was we, <clears throat> we could take, they might get us up at 4 o'clock in the morning and by 7 o'clock we might be taking off and it would take us an hour for our group to, to fly a pattern around the field and let each plane assume its proper uh, slot in the organization. We, there would be 36 planes, and each plane was supposed to be in a special slot, a special uh, part of the formation. So it would take us at least an hour to climb up to 15, 20,000 feet and get organized as a group. And then that group had to join the parade with other groups. And at, at, uh, at times, if, if we all if every group, and there were, there were 40, not 40 of them flew at a time, but there were 40 heavy bomber groups, uh, sometimes that stream between the last group, and we were about three miles apart, sometimes four or five, sometimes not quite so, between groups, sometimes that bomber stream would, might be 60 miles long. Uh, the, part, the part up here might be going in this direction, and we might be going in this direction, but eventually we would get to where they started this and we would follow across, uh, hopefully we would cross the coast where there was no German anti-aircraft guns. We called them flak guns. The German name for anti-aircraft was, <coughs> excuse me, flak. And uh, we tried to cross the coast where there was no where they couldn't place cannons, but that wasn't always possible. So sometimes we'd be shelled just starting across the coast. And quite often we'd be met with, with uh, German fighters, uh, not very far in, into uh, Europe. Fighters, uh, fighters, I guess, were more scary than, than the flak, but the flak probably d did more damage. Uh, do you, under, do you know anything about an artillery shell? Yeah. You do? Yeah. I don't know if the girls do, but <laughs> it's about so long, maybe. And it's made out of, a, of, um, of cast steel. And the inside has convolutions on it so that when the powder charge ignites and explodes, it will break up into many, many pieces. So you get a whole bunch of shards flying every which way from the center of the explosion. And uh, the Germans had gun batteries of, of four cannon, 88 millimeter, which is about what, three, a little over three inches maybe. And uh, they could pound those things up there. And, and actually, uh, if there might be 10 groups flying ahead of you and going over the same target you were, we, we often uh, broke off into separate uh, divisions and maybe uh, maybe five groups would bomb one target and ten groups would bomb another. But uh, but if you came to a target and you were the last group over it, as you got ten miles away from it, over the target itself would be a big black cloud. Well, not not really a, <laughs> a cloud, but a lot of the the residue from all the exploding shells that had been there. And I will tell you, it was pretty scary. The last, <clears throat> when we would uh, say we were bombing a target in a city here, the last 10 to 20 miles of our 
of our flight to the target would be on a straight line, the same elevation, no deviation at all, no turns, from maybe 10 to 20 miles out. And that was called the, the uh, initial point here, and the target was here. And we kept flying straight. No, you, you could not turn your aircraft to avoid the flak at all. You just had to fly straight and level and take no evasive action. And it was, uh, it was a scary operation. Were, were there any like specific battles that you can remember that like stick in your mind? Any battles? Yeah, like any well, like, specific <clears throat> event. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> see, every mission you flew was an individual battle, you might say. So I, I flew 30 missions, and, and the missions were roughly oh, 8, 9, 10 hours long. But as I said, it would take us an hour at least to get up to 20,000 feet and join up with the others. And then it would take us you know, four hours, maybe at, at 180 miles or 75 miles an hour, to get into targets deeper into Germany, for instance, Berlin or Leipzig or places like that that were a long way in. Uh, uh, it, it took a long time, four and five hours. I, I flew several missions that were well in, in excess of 10 hours of flying, and that's a long time to fly, considering the fact that I sat on a little wooden box about this big, you know. <laughs> uh, as a navigator, uh, I had a little desk that maybe was about this big, and I would lay my charts out there and maps out there, and I had a, a compass and an airspeed indicator and, and an altimeter uh, and, a, and a big piece of paper. And every five minutes I would read all the instruments and replot my position. Uh, I'm not going to go into the navigation and get your course in, but uh, I'd, I'd replot my position and, and tell the pilot that we were two minutes behind or five minutes ahead of time and, and perhaps maybe a mile or two miles or three miles south of the actual plotted course that we're supposed to be on. But that, that was acceptable. It was not a problem being that, being a little bit out of the way. You know. mm -hmm. And uh, we would fly with, with our group and maybe three or four other groups and, and hit one target. And, and uh, as I say, we would fly to the initial point and we were supposed to be there at, at uh, within two minutes. Now this is leaving England and, and flying four or five hundred miles and make it within two minutes to, to the, the time that, that the uh, intelligence uh, had set for us to be there. And, and we sometimes knew that and sometimes didn't. Uh, if, uh, if we had fighter attack on the way in, which was obviously common, uh, it, it might get the, the, the group out of formation and it might get them out of the bomber's stream if they were particularly uh, hard hit by the fighters. And uh, so times weren't always as good as they were supposed to be, but it gave us something to shoot at and, and uh, something everyone knew. Everyone knew that their time at the, uh, at the initial point. And, uh, everyone tried to get there on time because even though you're all flying in the same direction, uh, if one group is hit with fighters, it kind of slows up everyone behind and those ahead of it, of course, get out and, and you stretch out more. Uh, those are unimportant, but they do occur. Uh, what else can I tell you? I, I, I do a lot of talking. You, you should ask more. Oh. <laughs> buddy in, buddy in. <laughs> well, I mean, you said you uh, flew missions, I mean, all the way up to like Berlin. I mean, you're going straight into like the heart of. Germany in there. I mean, I couldn't imagine what kind of fear you know you would have going in, going uh, straight into Germany like that. Um, it, it, there was a little concern. In there. <laughs> a little yeah. concern. Well, I could imagine. Yes, I mean. yes, you were you were scared. Uh, many guys didn't do anything. They, if there were not fighters in the air, they just kind of sat immobile. Uh, I was I was lucky because as a navigator. You have to keep track, and you have to keep making these entrances, entrances in your log, and plotting 
the, on the chart, where you are, and, and it takes your mind off thinking about what it's going to be like when the fighters hit or, or when you're over the target. So I, I, I really relished being a, a navigator because it was a lot easier on me than it was on, on most of the other members of the crew. God, you, you take the kid in the tail of the airplane. Uh, anyway, I don't have those pictures here, but uh, one of them shows how difficult it is to get into the tail of that B-17. Uh, and if he were injured, you know, if he got shot from an enemy fighter or a piece of flak hit him, it was almost impossible to get him out of there. It, it would take two men, 10 or 15 minutes to take him out of his seat and move him back into the, into the bigger part of the fuselage where he could be taken care of, you know, put tourniquets on him or give him morphine or whatever was necessary. To, to, at the time, whatever you could do for him, primarily just try to keep him warm and sedated, but uh, that was a tough spot. The other tough spot was the ball turret. That's the little round thing, you know, with 50 caliber guns on it. Uh, very difficult to get him if he were unconscious. It was almost impossible to get him out of there. Uh, we could turn the turret and, and uh, open, it opened up into the, into the, the uh, floor of the fuselage, of the aft fuselage. But to get him out of there, a little, you know, a little round thing, and his his knees are up here someplace when he's sitting in it, and he's all curled up. So, you know, maybe he's, and many of them were small, but shows them as small people because there wasn't much room in the turret. But to get him out of there, even if he weighed 120 pounds, you know, it would take two guys a, an awful struggle to pull him up out of there. Difficult to get a hold of him. But that, uh, that never happened on our crew, our ball trip gunner always managed to survive okay. Um, did you guys have like plenty of supplies? I'm sorry? Time? Did you guys have plenty of supplies? Like food-wise, did you guys have enough food and...? Um, f food was really no problem. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't very good. We had <laughs> very many green vegetables, and, uh, but we had a, a fair amount of fruit, and, and uh, getting our laundry done was a problem. <laughs> we didn't have facilities to do it ourselves. So we used to take it to the English families in little towns near us. And, and when we'd go, we'd take all kinds of fruit, candy and gum. And, and oh, they were so grateful for it, you know, and the kids, God, little kids, you know, this big, they, they'd know you were coming and they'd be standing in the front window looking at you with these great big eyes. You know? <laughs> and uh, knowing that we're going to get some gum, some candy, and maybe some fruit. You know? uh, and that relationship, I've been back uh, three times to, to England, that relationship is such that if I go over there and, and wear that cap, and go out to those areas where the bomber bases were, go out to my own bomber base. <coughs> those people will not, I mean, they just cannot do enough for you. Even the younger people who, you know, who were not alive in those days, uh, they'll stop you and say, hi, Yank, glad to see you. You, know, and, uh, you go to a tavern, you, you cannot buy a, a beer, a mile of beer. Uh, it, it's a wonderful relationship. Uh, um, do you guys? Do you have like any photographs or anything? I'm sorry. Did you take many photographs? Photographs? Uh, no, it was difficult to get film. Uh, I, I, I think I took you know like maybe three or four rolls with me, and I don't think I got more than, a, than another roll all the time I was there. <coughs> uh, so I, did, I, I, I do have some pictures of this. <laughs> are these yours right here? Cause I can oh, show are they there? Back. Oh, very good. Yeah. First, I want to tell you what this is. This is called a, what's it called? 
Computer. Ah, computer. Uh, computer. That's <laughs> 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 uh, a it, it has to do with, with navigation, and this my son picked up for me at a flea market someplace. But actually, this to be complete, there would be a cardboard, plastic maybe, gizmo that's through there with lots of information and, and, and uh, drawing and so forth on there. But it, it's a navigation tool to figure out uh, wind speed and, and, and courses and corrections. Uh, if you remember your old physics, you know that, that uh, the North Geo Geographic Pole was at the center of the Earth, but the, uh, the magnetic pole was off some degree off, and so the compass never really, maybe twice, points exactly to the to the North Pole. So you have to make allowances for where you are and, and, and what particular uh, deviation is at any place, and that's what this thing helps you to do. The other thing is that it helps you to put both the wind that the uh, the amount that the wind will push in one way versus, as I say, the, the incorrect reading on the, on the compass. And, and, uh, and also f figure out when the standard thing is in there, uh, times and, and uh, uh, desti of, of destination for you. So it is, in a sense, a little computer. And there's also all sorts of silly stuff in the back that well, it's ever used on, on combat missions. Now, if you were, again, flying the ocean, you, you would well use those. The other thing is, if you flew the ocean at night, you had an octant, uh, well, some people call them sextants, uh, in which you could read the elevation of given stars above the horizon. And knowing those elevations for three stars at the exact time, uh, you could plot a little triangle of courses and get your get your location within two or three, four or five miles if you were very good. If you could hold that thing steady yeah. and, <laughs> and read it properly. Uh, but you you absolutely had to have at the correct time because you looked up in a book the elevation of any given star above the horizon. And so that you had to go in with your elevation and find out, you know, and that gave you a line. Well, actually, it's a circle around the Earth, but it gave you a line in all practical purposes. So you get three lines and you put them together, and you have a little triangle, and that's where you are, someplace within that triangle. That's celestial navigation. Uh, radio navigation, you, you just dial in two or three uh, radio stations, and I mean, even commercial stations would work with a with a compass that, that will point to the direction of it, read the direction, and, and plot those. Uh, oh, uh, radar is, is uh, was the latest during World War II. It was the latest kind of navigation, and that <coughs> that again. Uh, let me show you. Yeah. There, there's a B-17, and underneath, down here, you can see a little white bump. That is the uh, radar scope mounting in there, and it's been replaced. I mean, it has replaced the, the ball turret that was there originally, and those are done only to a few ships which apply uh, uh, as, as the lead ships in the group. And that's one that I flew in as, as uh, I, I, I'd say probably five or six missions at least when I became a, a lead navigator. And, uh, yeah, that's a B-17. So do you remember anything specifically about the day that the war ended? Where were you? What happened? Um, the war in Europe or the war in, in the world? I guess probably the world. The world? Yeah. I w when I was done uh, in March, they sent me back to the States in, in, in late March, <coughs> and I got married. Foolish thing to do, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they then sent me to Atlantic City. And I was there for about three weeks, 
just kind of relaxing and having fun. And then they sent me to Ellington Field in, in Houston, Texas, along with about oh, maybe three or four hundred other navigators similar to me. And we stayed there until the war was over, doing absolutely nothing. We had the only formation we had to attend was one to fly for four hours to get our flight pay, which was 50% of our base pay, and the, other, and the other one was to get our base pay, get our pay. That's all we had to do all summer long. So we, you know, we spent the, the days and nights doing whatever we wanted to do. Eventually, uh, my wife came down, but places to stay were obviously near any military base during the war were very difficult to fight. So she came down you know, maybe two weeks before the war was over. And, uh, that, that was all I saw of her for the whole summer. Brand new husband. <laughs> Tough call. <girl. laughs> but when you were, when you were stationed, um, did did they tell you a specific day when you were leaving, or was it just when they pack up or you're going back home? Oh, no. Uh, the original crews over there, who started in, in the late summer of, of 1942, uh, flew 25 missions before they could come home. And not many of that original group that went over there in the summer and fall in early winter of 43 came back. Uh, casualty rates were, were just tremendous. There were, the 8th Air Force suffered the greatest casualty rate of any major uh, element, more than the Marines. We suffered more per, per participant than the Marines did. That's, that's kind of hard to think about, but, but it actually occurred. We lost 26,000 men killed and another 25 or so thousand who became prisoners of war, who jumped out of, of airplanes that were uh, not flyable over Germany or, or over uh, German-occupied territory. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of people, my guy, my pilot was killed. I, I finished my missions on the 24th of March. My pilot was killed about two weeks later on he was, uh, he had decided that he would do another tour, so he was on a second tour. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I didn't, <laughs> he wanted me to stay, and I said, no, I'm going home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really glad I went home. I could well have been on that plane. But uh, it, it's, uh, it's it's a it's a tough experience to 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 do that uh, again. I think it's much tougher on the ground. Yeah. What's funny? We we could fly a mission today, be in the air twenty five thousand feet and have it fifty below zero. Uh, come down next day. We'd had a three-day pass, and by three o'clock in that afternoon, we'd be in London in a hotel. It's just, just incredible the way the way we fought, kind of a, like a gentleman's war, you almost would say. Uh, uh, Quinn, go to a hotel, have, have dinner in the dining room of the hotel. Poor food. Obviously, not very good food in England during the war because everything, almost everything, had to be brought in there. And there were you know, the whole Eighth Air Force was there, the Ninth Air Force was there uh, <clears throat> until D-Day. There was you know a million men on, on that island ready to cross the uh, channel. And food was you know, almost any, anything was tough to get, but uh, was, was worth having. Except, uh, except silver, silver. The co-pilot on our crew was uh, came from a relatively affluent family, and when he'd go to London, he'd go to the silver 
Smith's shops. And he had a little booklet and he'd look up who the, the marks on the bottom of the silver, the English silver, which was that. And if it was something he wanted, he'd buy it, have it wrapped up in a little box, and he'd send it home. <laughs> and, and <clears throat> I talked to his, he died uh, in 1983, quite young. And I talked to his widow a couple of times, and I mentioned to her this silver that he had sent home. And she said, what silver are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, he just sent it to his mom, and she never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm digressing here. Yeah. What else would you like? Um, did you travel anywhere while you were in the war? Pardon? Did you travel like anywhere while you were in the war? Uh, a little bit around England, not very much. Uh, travel, you know, trains were really solidly booked and it was hard. Sometimes you had to stand on the way into London. You might stand for an hour before you got a seat. So it was tough traveling around. Some guys, people, people that were there on the base as permanent party, you know, those people who were mechanics perhaps or weathermen or, or flight dispatchers, uh, those people who were permanent party, when they'd, when they'd get some leave, they would spend some time uh, touring uh, uh, England. But uh, mo most of the flight crews didn't do a lot of that. Some, but not a lot. Uh, at, at halfway through our, our uh, tour of missions, they took the crew and sent it off to a, a, a manor house someplace in, in England and uh, let you just do nothing for a week except uh, what you wanted to do. Maybe swim if it was warm in the summer, or shoot ski, or go exploring in, in communities. Uh, one of the things I did go, was go to Winchester Cathedral, go through Winchester Cathedral uh, in, in southern England. Uh, but that was sort of an R&R &R thing, and kind of break up the tour and get your mind off flying all the time. And um, one last question. Do you have any advice for anyone that is thinking about going into the Army or into the Air Force now? Be sure you know what you're doing, obviously. Going into the services now is, is not, you know, we're right on a ferry boat. Uh, you could wind up having people shoot at you, which is a very, very unpleasant experience. So be sure you know what you want to do. As long as you do, God bless you and good luck. That was the bell. Is that the bell? Yeah, that was the bell. Ding dong. Okay, <laughs> we got to get a picture. You stay right there. <clears throat> you st no, you stand next to Mr. Oh. No, you stay, sit down. You what, me sit? Down. What is going on? No, stand behind. Oh, okay, no, sure. next to him, kind of, right next to him. Guys. That's a good one. Smile. Okay, one more. Yep. So you're not blinking, so nobody's blinking. I want to make sure nobody's blinking. Smile. Perfect. Okay. Thank you okay, very guys. Much. The only thing I've ever done perfectly. Yep. <laughs> I had a lot of stuff to show you. Oh, never oh did you, you never saw any of the pictures? Well, they so one or so uh, Did, yes, did, did you just want to go through those pictures very quickly so they kind of know what they are? Because they have them already. We have already those pictures scanned. Yeah? So you yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then let me very quickly go through it. <clears throat> That's a B-17, obviously. That's Was the this cockpit. one of your planes? That's one I flew several missions in, yes. Okay. You yeah. could include uh, that's the pilot's cockpit. Those are the instruments. Boy, there. those were color pictures. That's kind of unusual, isn't it? Uh, At that time? Color film was just coming in, but these are not very real, really colored very much. Uh, this is my view forward. The bombardier sat on that little chair. This was his gun uh, control, and, and right in here is the bomb sight. It's hard to see because the chair is in the way. But I sat on a box against, this is the edge of the desk right here. Uh, that's, that's the view I had, unless I stood up and, and on the bomb run I would all 
was stand up and, and help the bombardier find the, find the target. Uh, that's it. Remember I was telling you about the uh, tail? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the tail turret back in there. And that's the way we had to get in and, and, and uh, get that guy out if anything ever happened to him. I'm, I'm telling you how tough it was to get him out. <coughs> Going the wrong way. <laughs> uh, that, those two vertical members there are the structure that held the bombs. You can see one bomb here. That's a fake bomb, obviously. You know, we're kidding there. This was taken. Oh, uh, oh so that was ta uh, those were taken after the war. Yes, these are taken in a, in a plane that's been restored. Oh, okay. But that's how narrow it was to crawl through that bomb bay from, from the back of the plane to the front of the plane. Yeah. There's a machine gun on the waist mount. Now, the waist mount is the mount right here. You can just about see it on there. That's that gun. Uh, yeah, there's one of that, that ball turret that shows it very effectively. Yeah. You have these? Mm -hmm. okay. I have all of them. So they'll know what they are. All right. Uh, that's the rear entrance to a, to a plane, and that's the plane that I have flown some missions in. And there's the front view of it. Uh, and there's another view of the front. Here's an overall look at it. Those will come to you. I guess you don't need Handsome devil, huh? Oh, devil. And is that your... <laughs> And here he is, with all the navigators on the uh, on the base at that time. You could put the PowerPoint and you could draw a circle around that one. Yeah. <laughs> have it on there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, these kids have to get to class. Does anybody need yeah. to pass? Uh, or you yes. think you're all set? Yeah. I might need one. Okay, write it up and I'll sign it. Okay. Okay. Oh, it was I nice think. meeting you. Well, I wanted to say it's certainly been a pleasure. Thank you very much. To, uh, boys. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Guys, stay good. Really my pleasure. You have all the paper stuff, right? I've got every. Well, you've got all the your cop. You, you've yeah. got it right here. Yes, I have it. I've but got you, copies you have of everything. What I mean is, you did copies mm -hmm. of everything. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice that we were able to make copies. That's it's in good. the OPH shared drive under Home Hometown Heroes. Mr. Simpson's is a folder. That everything's already there. So you guys can get started whenever you want. <laughs> Two weeks from today. That's it. Got to be ready. Okay.